So hi guys, this is uh, uh, Raj Cool, and this is the third episode of my podcast. And um, I'm going to take us a bit down memory lane. Um, I'm going to show my age now, uh, yeah, right now. So those of you can see on video already know who the guest is, but those who are listening on uh, Apple or, or, or Spotify, um, it, I'm going to just take you down memory lane to tell you a little story. So when I was 16, one of my most favorite albums, there was there was about two or three punk albums at that time. One was Excellencies Are You Ready, Got To Be Done, love those. But there was another album, which actually, the fact that I love singing and doing singing today is because of Punjabi Dance Nation. That was one of my all-time favorite. Even today, it's, it's probably one of my best albums. And that's why I'm going to introduce our very special guest. I'm so enthusiastic. I'm so excited. And it's and shit, this is a bit of a fanboy moment for me, to be fair, honestly. <laughs> because I've, I've grown up listening to your music and it, it, it's it's... Uh, the reason I'm into singing and even into the classical side of it because of yourself that's you're one of the main reasons and and for for UK Bangladesh so I'm just gonna start off just saying that Punjabi Dance Nation was one of my favorite bands one of my favorite albums ever and okay uh, and the basis of this podcast was just for me to find out more about you because you've been a massive influence on my uh, in my singing in my musical career um, even though my music career just restarted recently because of the because of gaps, well, we we'll talk about that another time. Um, yeah. So uh, we've actually met a few times before. You probably don't remember. But we met at a wedding recently, and I was asked to sing, but I I, I was a bit reluctant anyway. It was um, uh, uh, Sunil's wedding when you okay. performed. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, yeah, and I've got nice. another. I've got another thing where we formed. I've, I've just. I, I managed to find it. I was throwing away some of my clothes, and I found this. For those of you can see. Oh, oh my gosh! Yeah, 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 yeah. Will in Hall, two thousand and ten. So that, that's yes. me there. And that's you there. So. <laughs> two thousand and ten. Wow. Yeah, exactly. So I'm gonna Obvious. keep this. Yeah. Do you remember we had those? There was massive like life size um, uh, banners of us in that. Okay. Yeah, I, in that. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah, good. in all in all, uh, yeah. So that's that. So that's the basis of the podcast, and I want to find out a bit more about Shin, about you from from a fanboy perspective. And I'm sorry, I'm, I am a fanboy. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sort of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's start talking about a bit about your background. Um, um, how did you get into singing? Did you take formal training? Uh, no. When I, when I started singing, I realized. Um, that I had a knack for music really early in my life, right? I think I was probably about five or six when I realised. How that came about is um, my dad was a big uh, Bollywood film music buff, right? We used to watch Bollywood films every weekend. We'd be down in the cinema, me and um, my brothers, mom and dad, and we'd phone our uncles up as well. Yo, uh, Where's, where's the new film at? Which cinema? Because there's four or five cinemas in Birmingham, isn't it? And they all, they'd all agree which cinema they're going to go to, which films they're going to watch. And we'd all go down the cinema. And it, I'm talking about the 60s, right? Okay. And we were always growing up watching these films and at home listening to records, listening to the big spool on spool tapes. And Dad was always into the music, yeah? So the music was always playing. And subconsciously, this music was ingraining itself within me, right? And how I realised this was, we went to Blackpool once, right? And I, I dis- even to this day, I distinctly remember this moment, right? <clears throat> On the way, we went to watch the uh, the illuminations that they have at Blackpool, right? The, yeah, the Blackpool lights. The light. right? Blackpool lights, yeah. On the way back from Blackpool, we're in the back of a van, right? And I'm trying to go to sleep, I remember. And while I'm trying to sleep, I start humming this song, right? And I, I, I suddenly realised, that I know the whole song. This is about I'm um, five, six, or possibly seven, right? I realised I know all the music. I know all the melody, right? I didn't know all the words at that time completely, but I knew all the melody and every single piece of the music. I could hum it in my mind, and I and, and I shock myself, and I could hear it very vividly, very clear. All the strings and the the mandolin pieces and everything, and, and I, I was kind of surprised myself. Whoa, I know this, and then. I started to learn other songs as well. Other songs that I realised that I knew other songs as well. I could hum all those songs. And then I started singing the words as well. And I learned to speak early in my life, Punjabi and Hindi, by singing these Bollywood songs and Punjabi film songs that we used to watch, right? And that that was a very early realisation that 
I'm good at doing this music business, this music mm-hmm, stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm quite good at retaining it and then reproducing it. And then uh, when I was about 12, 13, a mate of mine from school used to go down the local Gurdwara, right? And he used to learn rags from the Gyanni at the Gurdwara. It was um, Ram Gadiya Gurdwara. Okay, the one in, uh, in Jewelry Quarter. Jewelry Quarter, yeah, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there used to be a... a a gyani there called a Gurdjieff Singh Kalsi, right? And he was into his classical stuff. And so I used to tag along with him and we'd just go down the Gurdwara. I said, I want to learn music, you know. And he said, Boy, why don't you come with me and we'll go down the Gurdwara and he teaches rags. So I used to go down there, learn some rags and bits and pieces. And I never had a budget, right? So I went to my mate. And my mate, my, youth, my mate used to say, can I borrow your budget for a couple of weeks just to practice these rags and stuff, right? And you won't believe I had that. I had that budget for two years <laughs> <laughs> until I managed to get a hold of one myself, right? He didn't mind because he was he was into music, but not that much. It's not yeah. as crazy as I was, you know. And I'd always be on my budget. I'd come home from school or whatever. And I'd go straight up into the attic, get on my budget, start working out songs and tunes, doing my rags, practicing scales and stuff. So it really started, kind of kicked off quite early for me, you know. And then just one thing led to another, and you know I'm I'm here today. So how old were you when you were when you would do this uh, the rugs on the budger when you first had the budger? Uh, I was about twelve. Twelve, brilliant. About yeah, about twelve, thirteen when I started that kind of going to the gurdwara and learning rugs properly mm-hmm. from beginning. Uh, but then you know obviously I was well into film music as well, so I'd I'd, I'd tag along with my mates if there was ever a part. It, it also like at, at family weddings and stuff. You know, I'm, we were all sitting in a room because family weddings weren't that big back in the day, right? You'd get like, yeah, there were school halls, weren't they? 20, 20, 30 guys in a room, you know, having a yeah. having a night before party, you know, and uh, they'd say, "Oh, Mundia Ganasana," you know, Shindia Ganasana or something. Else. And it used to be Bollywood songs. I'd sing like the Bollywood yeah. songs and stuff, and and they'd love it. And I started realizing, yeah, man, you know, this, I'm I'm enjoying this kind of stuff. I like this. You know, and as as I got a bit older, there was a friend of mine, uh, her uh, her Singh Mataru, who's an excellent tabla player, and he still teaches today. He still teaches in arts councils and in schools. And he's the guy that actually got me going with this kind of stuff, really. He'd, he'd, he'd grab me and take me along to some gigs that he used to play at, student union gigs, uh, little private parties, Merfield parties, and he'd t- and I'd tag along with him, go down to these parties, he'd come with me, Shin, and you know, we'll get you on for a couple of tracks if we get a chance, right? And I'd just be waiting for my turn to come, and then They'd invite me to come on and sing a few songs. He'd play top last. I want to play Baja. And I'd sing a few songs, you know. And I used to, like, gate crash these parties with him all the time <laughs> uh, and just try and get a chance to sing in front of people all the time. So, you know, the hunger was there all the time to yeah. want to perform, to want to get out there and do something, you know. And then, like I say, you know, uh, it, it just the whole thing gathered momentum from those years. It started off at that time, yeah. So did you carry on from there, like sort of, you learnt uh, uh, a bit about the classical uh, music uh, in the Gurdwara. Did you have an start after that? Yeah. Or? Well, uh, I learnt from Gurdjieff Singh, honey. And then I didn't actually get uh, an start till much later on, until when DCS started, right, the band. Uh, this was in 1981. Around 1983, uh, there, was a, there was a guy in the band called Charlie. D, Danny, C, Charlie, and S, Shin. And Charlie had uh, a cousin of his who had learnt from uh, Muhammad Rafi, right? Wow. And, <laughs> and Muhammad, Muhammad Rafi Sahib is my idol, right? I, I worship yeah. that man and his singing, right? Even to this day, whenever I hear a Rafi song, I can get goosebumps all over my body. That man's just amazing. Yeah, there's no other singer like him. There's <laughs> no, no other singer. Was. You know, and this guy had spent time with uh, Muhammad Rafi Sahib in the recording studios, watching him sing, learning from him as well, right? So he knew he had a lot of knowledge. I used to live here in Birmingham. His name was Mehboob Johan. And he'd, he'd, he'd sung songs in Bollywood and he'd sung songs in the Pakistani um, film industry, right? So I became quite close with him, quite good friends with him. And, and he was my first teacher. I wouldn't say like Ustad, but he became one of my first teachers uh, when I was about, this is about when I was about 22. And uh, he taught me a lot of stuff which was relevant to the way they sing in the Bollywood film industry, mm. the way Rafi Saab used to do his riyas and the kind of rags that they work with and, yeah. and the techniques that they use in Bollywood singing, right? 
And then a few years later, uh, I, I got a classical teacher as well, uh, Ustad Ajit Singh Mutlashiji, who's okay. here, in, here in Birmingham. Uh, and then an Ustad in India as well, Baldev uh, um, um, Narang Sab, who's uh, no longer with us, unfortunately, he passed away last year. But uh, Narang Sab is also my Ustad. He's in Jalanda, or he was in Jalanda, as I say. And yeah, so, you know, it's been a, it's been a good journey. You know, I've had some good teachers on the way who've given me the right kind of pointers to put mm. my the right direction. And I've also learned from uh, uh, Western classical music teachers, opera, opera teachers, singers as well, uh, because the two techniques of singing are very different, right? And in, in Western music, the main thing I got from Western music was how to use your voice properly. And projection. Vo vo voice, pro voice production. Uh, and how to support your voice properly so that you can sing for a long time and still sustain your voice, not damage your voice mm. and not ruin it. The best way to use your voice, because we do a lot of performing on stage, we're standing up, we're you know jumping around, doing mm -hmm. what we do. You've got to be able to conserve your energy and conserve your voice and not strain yourself and not overdo it. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's certain ways and techniques that they tell you how you, that you can apply to your singing to help you to do this properly, yeah. you know? And it's very important to know this stuff in order to get longevity in your career. Yeah, definitely. So guys, uh, th those are, uh, who, who are listening, so Jim, what advice would you give them to, if someone wanted to start singing? So oops, I'm hitting my mic. So what advice would you give someone starting singing? Because I think there, there are some very good singers who are not trained as well, aren't they? So, but in order to get to the, to the gist, yeah. of it, you need training, don't you? Yeah, you, you do, yeah. I mean, there's there's lots of natural born singers out there, right? I was a natural born singer as well, but you have to learn the craft properly if you want to get, like I say, if you want to get longevity. If you just want to be a party singer who sings at you know the local wedding party or mm -hmm. your mate's wedding, uh, or you sing in the bathroom, or whatever, that's fine. You mm -hmm. don't need to get training, right? But if you want to get, make a career out of it and get longevity and be able to stand your ground with other singers in the industry right who are out there and compete with those singers because if you want to be a professional singer you got to compete with the likes of you know the big singers that are out there Absolutely, yeah. stand around, you know and deliver your music properly mm -hmm. so it sounds professional and it sounds well done mm -hmm. uh, you know you've, you've got to learn the craft you've got to learn how to sing properly uh you know and spend your time doing your ears for singers because this is a phys it's a it's a physical thing it's like it's like anything else if you want to build your body if you want to become a, a, a bodybuilder, you got to get down to the gym every day. You got to work out mm -hmm. properly to get the results. Mm -hmm. If you want to be the best football player in the world, you got to get on the football field. You got to get a ball. You got to kick it around for about five or six hours a day, or at least three or four hours a day, to kind of get some kind of visible result in your playing. Mm -hmm. If you're just going to go out there, kick it around for ten minutes, and then come back in, <laughs> that ain't going to do jack. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to improve. You're not going to develop. You're not going to learn. So same with singing, because it's it's a physical instrument. You've got to work it every day. You've got to work it for at least three or four hours, a couple of hours every day to start with until you learn it properly for a good mm. 10 years or so. Mm. Once you've learned it properly and you learn your craft, you know how to use your voice, you're on your way. Absolutely. And, you know, when I first started singing, it was very hard for me to find a teacher I yeah. really struggled, even in Birmingham, like someone, it, it, I've had three teachers in my life, but sort of, uh, I found it really hard. But today, it's even easier because you could like have a teacher from India, cla purely classical, over Zoom. And that's how oh, I yeah. learn now. That's how I learn yeah. now. I, I'm learning pure classical. But the one difference, I, I wanted to ask you, one difference I found with pure classical is that I'm not allowed to use the harmonium anymore. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have to just bump it. And I'm really struggling with it because I've, all the time I've been taught with harmoniums. So over lockdown, I started uh, uh, learning from a, 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 a pure classical of Quran 9 in India over Zoom. Okay. Who do you learn from? Lord Say, Lord Say Jaipur. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. It's not Jaipur, it's Nagpur, sorry. I was getting mixed up. Then Nagpur, okay. yeah. But uh, he, he's moved to Kolkata now. So there, there are seven generations of, of classical uh, 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 singers and, and tabla players and whatnot. Nice. So, That's great. But the thing I struggle with is that because I can't use the harmonium now, I have to work out each note in my head. So and yeah. I'm, 
I'm just stuck on CD and E at the moment. I'm just doing the interval training. So I've, I've got this software called Earmaster, which helps me practice intervals. Okay. So so if I know, okay, I've jumped, how many sword have I jumped up? How many sword have I gone down? And I have to know that by heart because that's what he requires me to do. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like me going back to basics, to be honest. You know, I, 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 it's, it's really, really hard. I, I didn't realize yeah. how hard pure classical was without the harmonic. I, I've used the harmonium, harmonium as a crutch before, but I can't do that. So yeah, yeah, what's, right. your, yeah what's your opinion on that sort of, uh, that kind Ooh. of? You know th that kind of that that kind of training is really hard and and, and that's quite heavy. That that that's yeah. quite a heavy end to be thrown into, right? I've I've spent time with uh, lots of lots of uh, classical teachers, and I, um, Joy Chakrabarti, who's from uh, Kolkata as well, you know. And I had a couple of one-on-one -on -one classes with him when he was here, and he told me to practice that kind of stuff and and scales. He he like he says sing as many scales as you can. Right, just keep singing scales all the time because there's nothing like to the limits as well, from your low to your high. Yeah, you know, so that you can work your way through all your break points in your voice. It's all very important. And I mean, to conquer sur and find the right sur, right when you're singing with a dancer and be able to sing any sur anywhere, Ajoy Chakraborty is the master of that oh thing. God. Oh my God, you you can give him a a, a, a kalas. A, 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 uh, uh, Bella Cala C sharp, right? Yeah. Any note on that harmonium, and even between those notes, he'll be able to sing notes. You know, there's 12 notes in an octave. He'll yeah, sing any yeah. note you want. To sing, yeah. Right. What, 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 and then you, he'll it, sing in between those as well, if you yeah, want to. In pure classical, there's 24, isn't there? They, they well, got, yeah. 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 Got, uh, yeah. Uh, shrukis as well. Yeah, exactly. So it's yeah. amazing. You know, and it's endless, it's boundless. You know, it depends how far you want to take it. You yeah. know, you can, you can, uh, I know there are some amazing singers out there who have spent their whole lives just practicing and they are amazing singers. But does anybody know them? No. Has anybody ever heard of them? No, you will not know them. You will not know them, but they are amazing singers. And it's a shame, but, but it's a shame for us because we, a lot of people won't get to hear them, but they're not bothered about that. They're not in it for the fame. Mm. They're in it for the music. Their mm. life is dedicated to just conquering those 12 notes of that octave and be able to sing it in any combination, any raga, any way they want to. You know, that's what their life dedication is about. Mm. And that's, that is true art and true colour. They've given their life to their music. It's amazing, Shin, honestly, because, you know, I've never heard this side of, of... This is why I was so excited about this interview, because I've never heard this side of your... I've, I've had the interviews, but never this depth. Any yeah, well, guy, any yeah. guy, this one here. Well, yeah. it, all, it all depends on who's interviewing me. Isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know about music, and you yeah. want to talk about this stuff, and I'm always ready to talk. I love talking exactly. about this kind of stuff and my experiences in it and what I've exactly, learned. Yeah. You know, and it's amazing. It's it's an ocean. You know, it's an ocean out there. Yeah. You, know? you can spend what one lifetime is not enough as they yeah. say you, you realize all this stuff when you're reading it in books you say oh one lifetime is not enough to learn music you think nah man you know one life it's ages you know i can learn how to sing but it's not so simple yeah i'll tell you the truth right even though i've been learning the pure classical for about two years and i pure i can't sing one drug properly right from start to finish i can't do it i can't do the thunder properly i can't do the love <laughs> properly I can't do the, the bundish properly. Bundish, I well, just about do, but the rest I can't do properly. I'm, I'm embarrassed. To, if I, I, I would be embarrassed to sing that round cue. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you were to speak to any teacher, anybody, right, whether it's Pandit Chakrabarti Ji, uh, whether it's uh, if Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan Sahib, if he was still alive, right, if you said, Khan Sahib, can you sing a round properly? He will say to you, no, I can't. Anybody will say to you, they cannot sing a rag properly, the way that they would that the way that they would want to sing it. They cannot do it. They cannot achieve that point, or mm. they're still striving to get there. Yeah. Because because there is no there, there is no end point to this. Every time you get better, your end point increases. Right now, I can do this, and uh, when you get to that point, then you think, no, now I can do this. So you're never at that point of satisfaction where you can perfectly sing a rag. And you're happy with it. You'll never get to that point. So Thank you. <laughs> Thank try you. To get there. It's the journey is there. And yeah. You have to try and make that journey, but you will find that your bar will always start getting higher and higher. The better you get. 
Yeah. The bar rises with you yeah. all the time. That's massive words of encouragement from someone you've got yourself. And honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can, you start doubting yourself and I'm just like, get, get, you had my man that Nikoli done that, but yeah, on any, especially that, that, yeah, some of the Dana, right? Speed out to do them at. Like, so what I started doing, increasing them by one BPM, one BPM, and then I'll get done, then another BPM. Then like, That's, was, that is the way to do it. You know? Yeah. That, that even the, the best people in the world work at it work at it that way you got to yeah. do it slow and steady yeah. wins the race yeah not the fast not the fast boys slow and steady always wins the race i mean i, I was reading i was reading this article and i've seen a couple of interviews as well from music directors in the film industry they they, they, they were saying that when when rafi saab right we've been singing in the industry for years right and not that even when he used to learn a song right he'd learn it at half speed yeah so he gets all the melody, note for note, in the beat, half speed, and all the murkia, tana, everything he's got to do, note for note, exactly the way he's got to do it. He'll learn it at half speed. And then once he's got, once he's confident with that, then he'll do it at the proper speed. You think, wow, a man like him should just get it like that. But no, because there's so much briki in there. They slow it down and they have to analyze it and learn it that way. Slow it mm. down completely, you know, so yeah. that you can see it, so you can see everything clearly. Yeah. And that's why it takes time, isn't it? That's why it yeah. takes time. Yeah, that's why it takes time. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to move on from that side, even though I could sit here and talk to you all day about this classical stuff because I'm, I'm actually oh, yeah. learning so much from you. To, to be fair, and, and it's it's a it's massive provision. So thank you again, really, honestly, from the bottom of my heart. It's it's a massive my for me. My pleasure. We should get yeah. together sometime. I'd, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do yeah, that. Yeah. So I'm going to start, I'm going to talk about a bit about DCS. How did DCS form? You probably told people about this, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, DCS formed in 1981, right? 1980, Muhammad Rafi Saab died, right? And in 1981, there was a song competition held in Birmingham. Uh, it was to celebrate, uh, we'll celebrate. It was for... Uh, the one year anniversary of Rafi Saab passing away, yeah? And I wanted to enter that song competition. So I was looking for some musicians to help back me up to, to enter this competition, right? And the gentleman I mentioned earlier, Harjinder Singh Mataru, who's a tabla player, I went to him and said, look, yeah, I'm in a bandage, I need, to, I need to enter this competition. Can you help me out? He said, hey, yeah, I know some musicians, so we'll get them all together, right? And he pointed him in, in the direction of Danny uh, and Charlie and a couple of other guys that I got together. Then I got all these boys together and we, we, we formed a band, got together, rehearsed these songs and we entered this song competition, right? And in that song competition, Mungal Singh from Charles Bechan, they came wow. first. They came first because they'd been singing for years before anyway. And this is the first time I went on stage, right? And um, it was at a place called uh, Grove Cinema here in on Dudley Road. It's not there anymore. There's a Mac McDonald's there now, right? <laughs> but we came second in that competition. And I remember when I was singing a song on stage, I finished singing that song, right? We, I sang two songs. One was Dunia Kerekwale and the other was Pardai Parda, right? I remember when I finished my performance, right? And the, cr the, cr the audience was clapping. It was a house full, right? There was about eight, 900 people in there. Everyone was clapping. The adrenaline was flowing in my body. I had goosebumps all over. And the feeling was fantastic. You know, a feeling of accomplishing something, that you've, you've made a crowd happy and they, mm -hmm. they're enjoying your music and they're clapping for you. And I remember while I'm standing on stage at that moment, I made a decision that this is what I want to do. I'm going to do this. as a, I want to make a career out of singing, out of music, out of performing, out of making music, right? And that night, when we uh, loaded, our, loaded the van up with gear again, you know, we were driving home, I had a conversation with Danny and Charlie. They, were, they used to be in a band before that called Leo, which was a, a rock band. And they approached me and said, Shin, look, we came second today, but, uh, you know, don't let it get you down. You know, this is just the beginning. He said, we want to make a band. Would you be interested in joining our band. And I said, yeah, 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 definitely. Let's make a band. And he said, okay, we'll make a band. And uh, we'll call it this, DCS, named after the initials of the members. 
founder member was Danny Charlie and Shin. And that night in that van, on the way back from this comp- song competition, DCS was born. So that's, that's amazing. Night, that was 1981, August sometime. I can't remember the exact date, but it was around August time in uh, 1981 that uh, we decided to make DCS. That is phenomenal. phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you, yeah, but you've had like lots of musicians over the time. I mean, you said they've, they've changed the, 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 yeah. the musicians. Yeah, musicians have come and gone in DCS, right? Uh, but the original lineup, like, you know, they, they were phenomenal musicians because back in the day, even with even with recordings now, it's all computers, right? We didn't have computers back in the day. We used to have a click track that we used to play. We just put the click track on so yeah. everyone stays in one beat, right? And then the musicians would all be wired up and would play live to record. Yeah. Right? But we wouldn't all record together how it would be. We'd get like the uh, the drums, the bass guitar, and the rhythm guitar, and a guide keyboard down first. So th- these three or four instruments would go down first onto the backing track. And I would sing guide vocals for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So we'd all go in, record together, but the main instruments would go down one by one. <clears throat> so we'd have to keep playing the song until we got it exactly right in time with the click track and it was quite difficult first of all but then we got into it but the musicians were so good in our band in the early days like we had uh, Bala on guitar Dave on drums Raju on bass you know these boys were solid musicians and they, later on they became pioneers a lot of a lot of people who came into the industry after that used to copy these boys and picked up the way they played Man. by these these lads yeah, yeah, yeah. they were amazing Amazing place. Because because there's a massive difference, isn't there, look, between the, how music is recorded now and it was then. I mean, recently I did um, uh, uh, some live sessions. I did so we recorded all that live with a live guitarist, live bass, live live keys, and yeah. it took us two weeks of practice to get the one two songs done. <laughs> <laughs> we recorded it live, so it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so it, it's it's very different to how it was then. I mean, yeah. What's your opinion on that? Like, sort of it, yeah. how it is then, yeah. how it is now. Yeah, I mean, it is very different. Now, you know, with the advent of computers and samplers and auto-tuners and, and all these gadgetry, right? It's so easy. It's easy. You don't have to be the best singer in the world now to come out of a studio with an L record in your hand, sounding really good, half-decent, right? You can yeah. do it. But back in the day, it was all live. There was no auto-tuners. There was nothing. You had to sing in tune and you had to play in time. And your, your guitar has to be in tune and your keyboards are going to be, you know, you're going to be playing all your pieces. So you had to be good musicians. And the thing with us was, in, and with most of the bands of that time, is like we were, we were gigging every weekend, we'd be gigging, right? We were doing like 80, 90, probably 100 shows, over 100 shows a year. When we were at our peak, DCS, we were doing over 100 shows a year, which is like, you know, it was crazy. It was a crazy time for doing shows. So a lot of our training and a lot of, the tightness within the band playing together all the time, every week in and out we were playing and rehearsing as well at the same time. Mm-hmm. While we were doing two shows every weekend, we are rehearsing as well, you know? Right. And so as a band, we became very tight with each other musically as individuals. We knew each other. We just had to look at one, each other and we know what we mean musically, what we're going to do yep. next, you know what we're doing with the music. So that kind of translated into the studio as well. So when we were in the studio working, two, three takes probably would be done because we're so tight with each other. We'd work something out. And the lads were so quick that they'd remember these chords, you know, they'd remember the co- the arrangement of a song and two or three takes and the backing tracks laid. You know, so it was working a lot out on the road, playing live with one another really helped us to become mm-hmm. really tight and good musicians. Do you, do you remember the point in, in, in history when, when it actually changed? Like, so in the 90s, maybe, I'm guessing it was probably mid-90s or something, because you had like Punjabi Dance Nation and that. Was that live or was that semi Punjabi or... Dan- No, Punjabi Dance Nation was part live, but at that time, computers were coming in. Yeah. So a lot of the drum and... In the early days, it was like mainly drum beats and stuff that was recorded onto computers. Yeah. Because you could get all the samples for the drum beats. So we did a lot of the drum beats for Punjabi Dance Nation using loops and drum beats. And then Juggy would do the overdubs live, the rolls yeah. and stuff. So it was recorded that way, yeah. But there was still a lot of live stuff going on. The bass would go down live. The guitars would go down live, you know, and uh, keyboards would all be played in live. So, so yeah. So it was, it was a combination of all that kind of stuff. And so- on Punjabi Dance on Punjabi Dance Nation, a lot of people used stall samples 
But we, we, did, we recorded a track on there called uh, DCS Meets TDF, the, the Door Foundation, right? Uh, it was with a guy called Johnny Kelsey. Oh, a, Johnny. Ma- amazing door yeah, player. Yeah, phenomenal. Right? Amazing player. And he's done so much for the bank, the, the bank industry as regards door players. He, like, he's got a school which still runs the Door Foundation. It's got up and down the country. He's got affiliations in, it, in virtually every city. And uh, Johnny came to the studio one day when we were recording. He was in Birmingham while we were working on this album. And while he was there, we had a conversation. Well, why don't we do a track uh, where we're featuring a lot of door players on our album, right, on this one song? And, and, and I had this song that I wanted to do. I uh, spoke to Johnny about it. And we got 16 door players into a recording booth. Wow. <laughs> it, luckily for us, it was a big recording studio as well that we used to work at, right? And it had a massive room in there. We've got 16 door players in there. And the clatter that they made, mic them all individually, <laughs> put mics in between, and tried to isolate them as much as we can, right? And the, the sound that we got on that album, on that track, was just massive, just massive. And the stuff that they played, those door players, it's a masterclass for any door player in the world. If you can play the doors on that, if, if, any, if any dolly can play that song, right, on the door, He's a, he's a competent door player. He's a good door player. It became like a benchmark for all door mm-hmm. players. So if we were, if DCS were ever playing at a wedding, right, we get door players coming up to us because, buddy, you know, when you do that song, can I jump on and play with you? Like, <laughs> they don't want to come and show us, you know, we can play this song, you know, whatever. So it was like that became a benchmark for how good you are as a door player. Wow. But it was amazing. It was amazing, yeah. Wow. That, that is phenomenal. So I'm just going to move on because we haven't got much time left yeah. from our respective time. So um, how do you think, like, sort of uh, Bhangra, UK Bhangra scenes change from then and now? Oh, Bhangra, yeah. music Bhangra. The UK scene has changed a hell of a lot, right? Uh, back in the day, the bands of the UK, right, were the pioneers of the Bhangra music sound, yeah. right? We made Bhangra popular all over the world. Not, yeah. not, the artists from India were very inspirational, right? And they were very popular in their own right. But the UK Bhangra bands brought something new to the music. We, we took it to another level. Absolutely. Especially, yeah. bands, especially bands like DCS. We just, because we we're born in the UK, right? And our parents are from India. So we had a proper sound, proper fusion. We, we married the Western sound with the Eastern sound. Yeah, and people loved it. People connected so much with our. We had an album called One Two Three Go, which was a proper fusion album. You know, we pushed the boundaries on the album, and it just clicked with everybody, and it really clicked with the youth of this country, with the youth of America. All these NRIs kids that were born, including, born, including me, <laughs> including myself, right? yeah. and many generations after that. You know, and we sold those albums and those songs and those sounds back to India. And they lapped it up. They loved those albums. They loved those sounds and they loved those songs. And it influenced the music that was being made there at that time. You know, they started getting to the Western music. They started using these drum beats and these kind of Western sounds and influences like reggae, yeah. pop, you know, dance music, hip hop, R&B. And then when the DJs in this country came, like people like Bali Sagu, people like PNC, they then took it again to another level yeah. and started influencing music back there again. At this time, what's happened? The tables have turned. Now, India, the, 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 it's mainly the singers from India. They're leading the way. Yeah. Why is that? Because there's no singers, uh, you know, uh, emerging from the UK scene anymore. They're not here anymore. You know, even mm. the singers that are coming out of Canada, they're all boys that from that are from India and they've gone to Canada to live. Yeah. Yeah. They're not born in Canada, and the singers coming from here are not born here. Yeah. You know, we need. UK born talent to emerge and take over the scene again. You know, it's yeah. a shame to see the scene in the UK going down, going down. And unfortunately, to say singers like my, when, when singers like myself, we, when we hang up our microphones, and that day's going to come soon. You know, the the scene here is really going to suffer badly. Mm. It's really going to suffer because at the moment we're still trying to push things. There's still music producers here. You know, you've still got people like you know. PMC working, you've still it's true school, you know, you've got these kind of music producers, DJ Vix and these kind of guys still doing stuff in this country. There's mm. so many producers here, but there's no new ones emerging, you know, and we need to keep that music scene alive. Yeah. And people 
people need to get come out and, and you know make music. I don't I don't know what it is. I don't know why the scene has suffered so much here. But I I personally, this is just my opinion. I personally, there's a few things like one, the internet changed things because yeah. before people in India didn't or, or around the world didn't have access to the music we had. Yeah, yeah. The internet suddenly influenced, and they could do everything that we could do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Once they got access to it, so that that was one of them. And the other thing I think like. Is it the UK? I think it lost its identity because we we had a lot of DJs doing golf production and stuff, and you know, and it was the same sound. Where where this is just my opinion. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, not yeah. an expert in this. I, yeah, I yeah. found the same sound that where as when it was your time in the bands. Every album, every song was like phenomenal because you had a lot of live guitars, rock influences, hip hop. Yeah, it was just next level. Yeah, yeah. Where in the 2000s, everything music became very samey for the UK. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, very same. Because yeah, yeah. you were using the same sample, the same tool beat, the same, the same tumbi beat, the same tumbi sample. You know, you were using the same things, and it's I think that was the issue with it. Yeah, it's true. I believe that. I believe that. I mean, back in the day, all the bands had their own sound, they had their own individual style of playing, they had their own they had their own style of songs, competition, the kind of songs they're gonna sing, you know, up next thing they're gonna sing this kind of a song. DCS have got this kind of a song. Alap have their own sound, you know. Premier have got their sound, you know. You don't have their unique style, you know. So everybody had their own different individual. Exactly, style. yeah. Now, like you say, a lot of the DJs, a lot of these producers all over the world are all sounding the same. I mean, 90% of Pangara songs, probably even to this day, are made with the Gidia the Rania loop. Exactly, yeah. It's and you know that Tumbi sample that comes ago, from. I know that Tumbi sample. I that Tumbi. Sorry, huh? after you, after you, I'm interrupting you. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say that, that door sample is still going around. Door look sample. Was still using it, and it's still busted up the dance floors. Exactly. And there, there's that Tumbi sample that everyone uses. Now. Have you heard it? That there's one little the Doctor Zeus <laughs> Tumbi sample. That's used no in every every single Pongara song in India. The, 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 the thing I struggle with, shit. I try to like in my music, and it's not to everyone's taste because I try to do something a bit different. I call it alternative Pongara now because it's just, it, it, you know, because it's away from the mainstream. But not many people like it because I put a lot of electronic influences in it. You know, what I, like house music and stuff in, in my yeah, music. Yeah. But yeah. it's not it's not taken up, which I understand why, because it's not to everyone's ear. But, I'm, you know, I'm trying to do something a bit different that's not using the same yeah, samples. It. But it's hard to get people to listen to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I do understand it. It's very frustrating. I feel the same way. You know... I, I, I've kind of switched off from Pangra music now. I don't listen to it that much because it, yeah. it, you know what? It all sounds the same. It, everything is the bloody same and they're all copying each other. You know what I mean? No one wants to make music or, or, or experiment with music. Or, I mean, there's this, the, you've got 12 notes in an octave. You, there's more than four notes in an octave. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Use more notes. Yeah. Use more music. Look how many instruments there are in the world. Use them. Look how many tempos there are of music in the world. Pangra, you know, okay, we've got Pangra and, and everyone's, oh, this song is a hit in uh, 92 BPM. Right? Every song for the next three years is 92 BPM. Exactly. Come on, I'm, 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 uh, yeah. Come on exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, it, when we used to make songs in our album, we take you on a journey. Yeah. You know, there's, there's different tempos, different styles, you know, different things going on in every song. We've got 10 songs on an album. Every song is different. And you're going on a journey with us through, through that whole album. You don't get that anymore. You don't get that anymore. I just got people, you know, like, like I say, music has become very, very simple. Like you say, it's a, it's a tolki loop and a tumbi loop, and you got a singer singing over it. Yeah. Basically, that's it, right? Yeah. Well, and they might take a big bass on it, right? Oh. That, that bass is like very simple. It's not really, it doesn't, it doesn't take brains to play a bass like that. You know what I mean? You don't have to be a good player. It's yeah. just so, everything is so simple, so basic because, and, and the songs are getting shorter and shorter now. I've heard songs being released that are like not even two minutes long. A minute and a half. I've heard a minute and a half. And, and they're becoming hits and you think, what the hell, man? Yeah. What can you do in two minutes? The what, DC, what? When we used to make songs, our intro used to be nearly two minutes of a song before the words even come in, you know what I mean? And now the record company says, oh, no, yeah, in 10 seconds, you got to get the words in. And the song, if the song doesn't click in 30 seconds, 
That's it. People don't want to hear it. And say, what, <laughs> what, what, what kind of music are you making? And who are you making yeah. it for? Let me tell you a story. People Sorry, are becoming too simple. People are becoming too yeah. simple with the music. You know what I mean? They need to expand their mind a bit. Well, let me tell you a story. You know, my first comeback track is all, which I did recently, right? In about 2000, of the lockdown. You know who the most, you know, you know who listened to it the most? Uh, Gordon did. Gordon, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gordon loved it. When I mean, my manager at work, his kids and him, they had that song on repeat. <laughs> well, there you are. There you are. They had the song on repeat and they said, all right, but you know, uh, I, and I said, oh, thank you. I sent them out some merch. I said, guys, thank you. I'm only an independent artist. Then it made, you know, I sent them out some merch and stuff just to say thank you because they, uh, they listen to you on, um, uh, you, can, uh, you know how you got Apple Music, you got Amazon, uh, uh, Amazon yeah. Music. They listen yeah. to you on that and the figures that Amazon Music were high because of them. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just shows, like, you know, so, sorry, okay. I, sorry, I was, I was working on a track. We just re released one of our old tracks called Nashadi Abandabal. It was DJ Vix, right? Great producer, great guy, yeah? When we were when we were working on this song, right, and we were discussing it, how we're going to do it, change it from how it used to sound. And I said to Vix, look, Vix, I think you should use some of the old pieces of the music that we used before, right? And... Uh, Kind of work them into the song because they were, they were really different. What we did with that track was very different musically as well. And he said, Baji, I, I don't think we're going to play any pieces in there except for a tumbili. I said, Why? He said, Well, he said, What happens is, I just go, if the singer stops singing right on a track, uh, and, and if it, the music piece should be very small because if it goes on for too long, kids don't know what's going on in the song anymore. He said, They get lost. You see, you, see, you see them looking at you. Think, what? What is this? Where's the singer gone? Why is yeah. the singer sitting? Or why oh. is the beat stopped? Or something like that. You know, it, it's kind of throws people on the dance floor. So if you listen to this new version of uh, uh, this song, uh, Nashiri Bandul, th there's no pieces in it except probably Bumbi uh, Licks. And I'm, I'm always thinking, well, well, what's happening to people? Why are they becoming so dumbed down when it comes to music? Do you know, I, 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 that's a really good point because when I when I when I produce tracks, I I I'm still old school. Like I I listen, listen to you guys, so like I'd put like a like a two three bar piece in between in between each yeah. each, each, each verse, and even in my tracks, even today, I'm still doing that. I've got back into production recently, so I was producing the other day, and I actually, oh, what could piece should I do here? But then now that you mentioned that point, I'm thinking, should I include it or not? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, let, let me give you an example how much I'm into music, right? We did we did a show uh, just a few weeks ago called One Last Dance, right? Amajit Sidhu. Yeah. Big time promoter from back in the day. There was uh, DCS, Apna Sangeet, Serge Sahota, and Mangal Singh, right? And Pretty Cool. And Sahota's was one of my favorite bands, right? Unbelievable. And the thing with Sahota's is some of their music pieces were amazing. As soon as their music used to play, you know, that music would I'd get goosebumps. And I'd go, amazing you know the sound and what he's playing the way he's played it and the rhythm and everything all through his set i was standing side of stage right and i was dancing all the way through his set off stage around the sides so and no all could see me and i, I loved it and the, every time his music would play my my i'd had goosebumps all over my arms you know it's just amazing and that music you need that music in those songs because the yeah. music is those music intervals are as important as the vocals and what the vocals are saying. And they, they, they're they equally as part of that song, you know. Uh, as, as soon as that song, Dangadita uh, Akiyane, Sohocha song. <laughs> Even today, that's iconic, isn't it? Iconic. I need to get used once yeah, now. But, yeah. <laughs> I'll get two balls now, you know what? Oh, that just sends you, you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you yeah. feed, your your body just can't stand still. Oh, those those songs are amazing. And those, you know, and that's just the hotus. And there's so yeah. many more examples out there yeah. for other bands as well, you know. Those music pieces are an integral part of the song itself. And to lose that kind of structure to songs, yeah. it's a shame. It's a shame. It's happened in Bollywood as well, isn't it? They don't use it in the day now. For me, yeah, stuff like Goddess. That's not there anymore. Yeah, look at that like, stuff. What an identity. Yeah. That those those music pieces are identities of those songs. Yeah. You know, and to not have them, just have a simple tumbi lick in every bloody song, you know. Uh, uh, 
or a dud? Just uh, is, it, is that the lead piece? Is that it really, boys? Come on. And it's down to the producers of the music. It's down yes. to those boys to pick to pick the level up again. You know, not dumb it down so much, not make it so easy. I, well, this is my opinion. Like, I think in the UK, we should be doing our own thing, not copy yeah, people. Precisely. Do our precisely. own thing, and then we'll we'll slowly start getting back. Yeah, that's what it is. We've got to give that music to the listeners for yeah. them to start appreciating it again. Yeah, and it yeah. needs to start from the top. The you know, the top producers here it needs to start yeah. from there because then and everyone else will start doing it. Yeah, yeah, those boys need to start doing it, and then you know, music, music, make music intelligent again. Yeah, people will start to listen to it and start appreciating music for what it is again. You know what I mean? Yeah. it's not just about dancing. Pongra, Pongra is there. Pongra is the genre. Pongra serves its purpose, right? But there is so much more to Punjabi music than just da 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 da. da, da, da. You know. It's, there's a lot, so much more to it. 100% and, agree. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take up more of your time. Let, one last question. Huh. When's, when's, uh, when's your new music coming out uh, uh, after this? <laughs> well, uh, I'm working on stuff at the moment now with a few different producers, yeah. So there's stuff in the pipeline. Just keep watching this space and there'll be yeah. something out very soon. Yeah, and any last message, any last words for, for the listeners, guys? Uh, should... Well, you know, um, like we've been talking about, you know, it's... I would hate to see the UK music scene just fizzle out and die, right? So please, guys out there, whoever you are, wherever you are, come out, make some noise, you know, and learn your craft properly. Spend time learning to sing, spend time learning your instrument. But please, come out there, expose yourself, make music, you know, get in touch with me, get in touch with Raj, get in touch with people who can help you along your journey. We're, we're always there to help. Just pick up the phone, make a phone call. You can get in touch with us. Our emails are all over the place. Phone numbers are all over the place. Just pick the phone. If you need help, get in touch with me, and I can put you on the path. But please, come out. Make some UK musicians, singers, artists. Make some noise again. Please, yeah. 100%. Let's bring it back, guys. So yeah. thank you so much, Shin, for your time. And I'm, honestly, I'm so sorry I've gone over. It's just that I've got to talk to you. I can talk to you, I can talk to you all day. So bless I you. Don't... Like I said, let's link over a, a cup of desi cha, make a nice cup of desi cha. Absolutely, 100%. We'll have a good All chat. Right. chat. All right. Yeah? Thank you so much. God bless you. Nice Bye. Bro. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. So, guys, thank you so much for listening. And that is the uh, podcast with Shin. And if you can like, share, leave your review, leave your feedback, that'd be great. So thank you. God bless you all.